Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, American History 1301. This is presentation number two in this series, and we're talking about American history roughly from 1700 to about mid-century. We're going to stop with about just about uh, the Seven Years' War, which is 1763 to 1775. If nothing else, we'll try and get that all set up, and then in the next presentation, we'll get you from the mid-century through the American War of Independence and to the late colonial period. Okay, uh, the topics that we'll be talking about is the colonies, especially the Great Awakening. We'll talk about the John Peter Zinger case, and this is be the first major court case that we've talked about in 1301. We'll be addressing issues associated with colonial slavery and the triangle to trade routes, that is to say the growing economic strength of the colonies. And this is going to be important later on when we start talking about the, uh, in the French and Indian Wars, also known as the Seven Years' War, and how critical the colonies are becoming for the greater British Empire. I'll start setting up the French and Indian Wars, uh, and this is going to be a struggle that is going to... Uh, and most people don't know this, is going to wind up being a global struggle. Later on, we'll talk about the interwar years, 1763 to 1775, and uh, what is actually going to drive the, the split between the American colonies and Great Britain. A part of that is going to be dietary neglect, taxation. It's going to be all about the issues behind the issues, so uh, pay close attention to what's going on here. In other words, it's got to be very superficial. We have to dig into these affairs to discover what's really driving uh, American history really in the early 1700s. So what we're talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is middle colonialism, 1700 to about 1750. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I guess this is uh, American History 1301. Uh, this is uh, part two. Uh, your readings are text, text chapters one through five really to page 123 and uh, take a look at the Declaration of Independence. This covers uh, everything from, in other words, chapters 1 through 5 to page 123. This covers, in your textbook, covers everything from pre-Columbian America to the outbreak of the American War of Independence in 1775. So as soon as, in your readings, as soon as you get to the Battle of Lexington Concord, stop right there. I do want you guys to take another look at the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we'll actually cover that right after the first test. Our landmark on this in this course is going to be uh, the American War of Independence. When that starts, we will stop and have a test. So thank you for your time on this. Make sure you keep up on your readings. And let's go on to the next slide, and we'll start talking about uh, life in the early colonies. I'd like to continue here with our uh, discussion of ordinary life in the colonies. Um, we've talked about witchcraft, we've talked about the role of spirituality in the colonies, and it had a huge impact. Cannot be overstated. But let's take a look at something as uh, simple as education. For most people, education took place in the home. As you can see from this image in the upper left, um, what would ordinarily happen, we're talking about in the, from the 1650s on, you take uh, one of the young ladies who understood um, basic arithmetic, basic uh, language skills, reading and writing, and give her the task of raising uh, the literacy of the other children of the village, of the community. Well, at that stage, uh, she would gather, as you can kind of see here, all the children in the village and begin the teaching process. Now, again, this cannot be overstated. Literacy is going to be very, very high throughout this entire colonial, colonial period because Protestants insist on reading the Bible. Now, the ability to read is a transmittable skill. In other words, if you can read the Bible, then you can read anything else. So literacy will, will be high. And we'll talk about uh, the other things that are going to be read. Obviously novels, that's not going to be very widespread, but newspapers will be widespread. And that will become important in a few minutes. But I want to talk on a broad level about education. Now, beginning really in the mid-1500s, education levels will be very high, 80 to 90 percent literacy rate. 80 to 90 percent literacy rates throughout most of Europe, especially northern Europe, and in the colonies. 
This will remain high at 80 to 90 percent until the first industrial revolution, right around the year 1800, maybe a little bit later. Then through most of the 19th century, as a result of, indirectly as a result of the industrial revolution, literacy rate will plummet. It'll be down to 25 to 30 percent. We'll get to that later on in this uh, course of exam in this course of uh, American history, 1301. But during the time frame we're talking about, literacy rate is very, very high. Going into the 20th century, it will go back up to that 70, 80, 90 percent rate. But there will be a different motive for that. That will be in 1302, and we'll talk about that later on if you continue this course with me. So here we go. If you'll take a look at the image. How, and in other words, I want to talk about now how education actually took place. And this was very one-on-one -on -one for most people. If you'll take a look at the upper right image, you'll see a primer. P-R-I-M-E-R, -E not primer, but in this case a primer. And many of these survive from the era that we're talking about. As you can see, it's all of the alphabet, it's uh, all the vowels, and then a series of uh, extracts from the, from the scriptures. Documents like this would be uh, varnished or glued onto a board about, I don't know, four or five inches wide. That's what surviving examples look like. And then at the base, it will narrow to a sort of a handle. <laughs> and so what emerges is you hold on to, with the handle, you hold on to this primer and you read it. And if you don't do a good job in reading it, then it can be turned into a paddle. And so uh, there was a lot of violence in those early schools. All the children talk about how their schoolmaster uh, would very often paddle them if they didn't get the lessons right. There was a lot of strong discipline uh, exhibited by these Protestants. Now this is what happens for most children. At about age 10 or 12, maybe 13, 14, maybe a little bit later, most of the girls stop their primary education. In other words, they've got enough reading to get them through their lives. And they go on to a different sort of education. How to get through a household. How to manage household accounts. How to sew. How to turn wool into yarn that can then be turned into clothing. How to iron. How to cook. These are very, very critical skills to get through a household. For the young men, education may go on for just a year or two longer. Uh, a little bit better at math, especially to take care of accounts. A little bit better at reading to uh, presumably in the future be able to deal with contracts. But then their education goes into what it is to be a life on a farm. How to sow, how to reap, that is to say how to farm, how to manage animals, how to hunt quite possibly. or presumably in a city situation, in a more urban situation, they're going to go into an apprenticeship. How to be a blacksmith, how to be a carpenter, how to be a bricklayer, uh, how to be a tailor. For the rich, wealthy, and elite, the upper one to two, maybe three, maybe as many as the upper five percent of society, in this early colonial period, they're sending their young men back to England for education. In the New World, in America, the first colleges don't really arrive until the very late 1600s, the very early 1700s, 1720s, 1730s. But up until that front time frame, uh, the, the sons of the rich, wealthy, and elite are invariably going back to England. Now this can be very tragic, and surviving records show this very, very clearly. In other words, there's a parting where this young man is put on a ship. Remember the ocean is a highway, not a bar barrier. They're sent back to England when they're age 10, 12, 13, and they're not returning home until age 20 or 21. Many is the story of the returning son going back to America, having gotten his education in England, presumably, and mom and dad don't recognize him. The last time they saw their child, he was small, very small indeed. And returning, he's a young man. But at that stage, and this will be a continuing theme in American history, this young man with a college education from England is prepared to take over the family business. So the rich, wealthy elite considered it their duty, a noblesse oblige, the noble obligation, 
that they should continue on to rule, to govern the, the province, to govern the colony for the best interest of the colony because they had been college educated in England and their children had, had received a great education. This sets up a ruling elite and they are very, very uh, careful of their prerogatives as we have seen before in the events of 1688 and we will see going forward in the events of 1774-1775. So don't forget that the ruling elite are very careful of their political position. They're very careful of their prerogative. Now let's take a second to take a look at the heart of ordinary communities. This is the tavern. Now ladies and gentlemen, uh, most people back in those days knew not to drink the water. Water carries all sorts of uh, diseases and uh, problems that everyone knew at the time would create sickness. So most people in this time frame, in the time frame we're talking about, drank beer. From the time a child was very, very young, he drank beer. As soon as he got weaned from milk as an infant, as a very, very small child, he drank beer. Now this is called small beer. Not small in quantity, but small in alcohol content. This is a product of the local tavern. Men and women drank beer most of their lives, whether it had a higher alcohol content or a lower one. Therefore, every community, every town, and every village had to have a tavern. Taverns were the heart of the community. This is where the local beer was brewed, produced by the local tavern owner, tavern keeper. Now, husband would typically be back in the back room doing all the brewing process. This was very time consuming. It's a semi-skilled labor. So going forward, we find that Ironically, one of the most widespread businesses owned and operated by women are taverns. In the colonies, the most widespread business venture is tavern keeping. And for women, they are, this is a business that's open to them. They can be owner operators of taverns, not simply bartenders or uh, serving maids, but actually owner operators. So on a typical day, and this is about lifestyles in the colonies, uh, young children would go into the tavern. Uh, they would be bringing uh, what was called a can, K-A-N-N, -N, an old German word. And they would say to uh, the owner operator, listen, I need uh, two cans of small beer and one or two of strong beer. Well, this would be loaded up by the tavern keeper and put on a bar tab. Then off the child would take this back home so that everybody there would have something to drink. Newspapers would also arrive in these taverns and that's where they would be read by the broader community. Everybody read newspapers. In many places in Connecticut and Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts, a township could not be founded without a tavern for the mail. Mail was sent to the tavern, that's where you went and picked up your mail. That's where you went and read the newspapers. That was the social heart of the community. Every community had taverns. They're very widespread. Now again, please don't forget this. This is going to be a, a, a continuing economic and social dynamic until the very end of the 19th century, until the end of the 1800s. Saloons were everywhere. Taverns were everywhere. They remain a widespread business venture. All right, uh, well, let's uh, continue on with our discussion with uh, then the uh, next slide. Uh, in this slide, all I really want you guys to get out of this slide is just a, a sort of a snapshot view, an illustration, if you will, of what it meant to be uh, part of that tiny little slice of middle income families. Uh, the middle class and the time frame we're talking about, the end of the 1600s uh, throughout most of the 1700s, is only just then emerging as a social economic group. But this period illustration of what might have been like uh, in a, uh, let's say the, the family of a doctor or a lawyer, uh, one of the local ruling elites, if you will. Uh, we have here a piece of furniture you can see against the back wall. Uh, today these are worth a vast treasure of money. But this is uh, called a high boy. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, an expression of wealth. Uh, 
what these ladies are doing they're gathering together for a, a sort of social gathering and they're quilting everybody everybody back in those days had to have quilts there's no central heat no central air you can see the children running about uh, you can see pets in the foreground uh, this is just a, an expression of what a middle income this this tiny little middle class this is what they would have looked like so uh, just, a, just, just a continuing snapshot of what it meant to, to be a colonial in the time frame we're talking about. All right, let's keep on moving and uh, get on to, uh, I have a few words to say about the Great Awakening. And uh, I've mentioned this before in the context of witchcraft, but that's what the next slide is all about, the Great Awakening. Uh, let's go over this slide really quick. This is just an outline slide. We're going to be talking about the Great Awakening. I have a lot to say on this uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, the origins of the Great Awakening, again, the ocean is a highway, not a barrier, began really in England. Um, some sources talk about the, the origins of uh, the Great Awakening as, as early as the 1680s. I think that's a little bit thin. Uh, they talk about it ending in the 1770s. I think that's a little bit far. Uh, so the, when I have the dates up there, 1730s to 1740s, that's really the height of this movement. But the origins are in England. Uh, it's transmitted across uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, what characterizes the Great Awakening? Again, a religious movement. It's all about grassroots. This comes from the base. This comes from the people. Uh, to be clear, our thesis is in the Great Awakening, the religious needs of the people are not really being met. And I'll talk about that more in the next slide. Uh, dynamic oratory. We're going to talk about some of the big figures in the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, uh, he's going to be a, a tremendous speaker on this. He's just an example. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Great appeal to women. Uh, as it turns out, uh, when women are interested in uh, spirituality, men get interested in it. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that and why that should be. The results of this going forward uh, is the establishment really of the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church in America. These are just fractal. These are fractures of the greater Protestant movement. And so as we go through the next few slides, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take, a, take a look at that. All right, well, let's move on to the next slide then and talk about the Great Awakening. Okay, in the previous slide, I pointed out that there were uh, several things that characterized uh, the Great Awakening in America, uh, dynamic oratory, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the needs of the spiritual needs of the people of England uh, were kind of not being met. And so uh, what I want to do in this slide is go through some of these personalities uh, and um, try and some, as Dr. Buchanan used to tell me all the time, put some meat on those bones. So let's take a look at some of the, some of the uh, individuals who characterize the Great Awakening in America. Now the idea here is that the spiritual needs of the people were not being met by the spiritual dynamics exhibited in the Church of England, the C of E. Now let me reiterate this. See, the sermons were being written by the archbishops, they were being written by the cardinals, they were being written by the fathers, and they were actually quite boring. They had to be very conservative in the way that they interpreted the scriptures. Imagine working all week long, and then you go to church on Sunday, and your rector or the preacher gets up there and the fire gets up there and he just reads what he's been handed by church officials. And so this is very boring. There's nothing very exciting about it. And so one of the things that characterized the Great Awakening is this very, very dynamic oratory. Some of the purpose personalities that are associating with this, let's take a look at the lower uh, left slide, the part of the slide, Cotton Mather. Uh, he is... Um, father's name was Increase Mather, and they'd been part of the Puritan movement uh, throughout the 1600s. But as you take a look at the dates, you can imagine that he's very, very active towards the end of the century, and he's kind of associated with the witchcraft event in New England. Now, Cotton Mather's work that he's known for is The Wonders of the Invisible World. And one of the things that characterized Cotton Mather is that he is insisting, so many were, that if God is in your everyday life, then the devil must be in your everyday life. He's out there. And Satan is looking to snatch your soul. Uh, part of the witchcraft uh, event was the idea that we have all these heady uh, uh, 
issues that involve different people, and so Satan's going to capitalize on that and give you special powers to get back your enemies. Well, this is the path to damnation, and this is what Cotton Mather is saying. Satan is out there. He's looking through every day. He wants to try and grab those souls and drag you off into hell. Well, this is quite a bit different than what the, the, the sort of conservative, sort of staid uh, uh, message of the C of E was giving. So people really did like what Cotton Mather was sort of saying and the dynamic oratory that he was uh, exhibiting. Another important figure in this uh, uh, event, and take a look at dates on this guy, so Jonathan Edwards sort of, um, he's very active at the apex of the, this Great Awakening movement. Uh, if I mentioned this before, forgive me, let me mention it again right now, when we're talking about the Great Awakening, we're really talking about um, sort of 16, late 1600s, 1690s, and then it peaked probably 1740s, 1730s, 1740s, and then it starts to, starts to sort of uh, uh, trail off, really, um, towards the end of the century. So Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, Jonathan Edwards, now we'll, we'll start with Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, for those of you that ever take some English literature classes, you're almost certainly going to get this. Now, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, this is all about hell, fire, and damnation preaching. It's just all brimstone. Um, hell is a terrible, terrible place, and you are going to go there if you don't change your ways and, and walk that very narrow path towards salvation. By contrast to the others, instead of this really loud, uh, uh, boisterous sort of uh, delivery style now, Jonathan Edwards, now this is very dynamic, but just in sort of a counterintuitive way. Jonathan Edwards, uh, the way that he presented the, the material, in other words, this hellfire damnation, his delivery was very cold, very reptilian. And he would look at his parishioners, and he would look them right in the eye and say, basically, listen, you don't change your ways, friend. You're going to hell. It was a very cold, very, uh, very personal sort of thing. He had a very low voice. He would point to individuals in the crowd and say, you, you, my friend. It's going to be you next. You're the one that's going to go to hell if you don't change your ways. You know you're a sinner, and if you don't change, bad things are going to happen to your soul. As the story goes, Jonathan Edwards uh, was uh, given one of these speeches, uh, given in one of these sermons, and a young woman in the front row in one of the pews uh, sort of fell down and writhed all about and had a sort of a fit, and uh, he stopped everything, went down and picked her up and basically dusted her off and gave her a little drink of water and kind of, you know, got her calmed down, got everybody calmed down. He went up with a pandemonium, Got back up there in the pulpit and went back to uh, went back to the speech, you know, went back to to the sermon. So he's very cold in his delivery, but it's a very very powerful message. George Whitfield in the upper left corner, uh, there he is. Uh, George Whitfield begins in England, and we've talked about this before. He begins in England. Uh, I'll have to check dates on that. I think I actually have the dates between him and Jonathan and, and Cotton Mather. Those switched. I'm pretty sure that's right. George Whitfield was 1714 to 1770, and Cotton Mather is 1663 to 1728. I'm pretty sure that's right. So, sorry about that. I have a mistake on my slides. George Whitfield. Now, he begins in England, and so he's a really good uh, um, example of how the ocean, once again, is a highway, not a barrier. He's crossed the Atlantic 18 times. Very early on in his life, at thought about 17 or 18 years old, George Whitfield comes home to glory. He feels that he's uh, received the message of God, and he wants to get out there and talk to people. Now, as it turns out, George Whitfield did have a very loud voice, and uh, he attracted huge crowds. And so many times, as kind of that, that center part of the slide indicates, he was outside uh, in, in, in nature's sort of uh, oratorium. He was out there in the fields, out there in the countryside, actually. Preaching. And he attracted huge crowds, just too big to even fit into a church. Well, this sort of had an unexpected side effect. Officials would see these giant crowds being harangued by one of these preachers with a loud, booming voice who was not really uh, following the message of the Church of England. And so they gently uh, talked him into taking his message over to the New World. So he'd get on the boat and go to the New World. Well, he'd preach all over in the New World, 
in, in, in the New England colonies, and they would get kind of um, nervous about him there and gently persuade him to go back to England and preach. So he crossed the Atlantic 18 separate times. In one very famous example, uh, Franklin uh, to put his oratory skills to the test. In other words, George Woodfield had a very strong reputation for being able to reach 10,000 people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, think about that for just a moment. Um, if you get outside and you don't have a sort of uh, any sort of electronic amplification, how are you actually going to be able to speak to uh, not just one or two or three thousand people, but maybe as many as ten thousand? That's that's quite a voice. So Ben Franklin had heard about this oratory skill and he actually tried to put it to the test. Now, as you can imagine, Ben Franklin, who was a Quaker, he didn't really uh, uh, go with the C of E sort of message. Uh, he politely walked up when George Whitfield was given one of these sermons, walked up to the podium sort of thing, and very politely, you know, he's part of the crowd, and he starts to very quietly step backwards. And he counted every step as he was stepping backwards to sort of measure this. When he got far enough away that he didn't hear George Whitfield very clearly, he sort of made a mental note of the distance. Well, this is the radius of a circle. And then he calculated uh, the sort of the, the arc of the circle, and then how much space within that that each human being would occupy. And he did the math, and as it turned out, George Whitfield really could reach 10,000 people in these sermons. He had that loud of a voice. So uh, George Whitfield had a very long speaking uh, career. Again, I think I got the dates wrong, 1714 to 1770. I'm sure that those are the dates associated with George Whitfield. Uh, as it turns out, again, a little story on George Whitfield. Uh, he was uh, older by this time, and he was getting sick. And um, but somebody invited him to speak to their uh, congregation. He accepted. Um, showed to the congregation, and basically said, "Look, he was very, very sick and very, very weak." So they strapped him to a door and propped him up, and he gave this long sermon and harangued the audience and tried to bring them home to glory and tried to put forth the message of God. And when he was done, he turned to one of the people and said, basically, you know, kind of lower him down, I'm done. And uh, turned to one of the individuals that's there and said, look, I'm dying. And he died. So he died basically with the word of God right there in his mouth, right there in the church. That was the end of George Whitfield. But um, again, what, what characterizes all this is a very dynamic oratory. Uh, people are outside. Uh, they're, they're receiving this uh, sort of unscripted message of God. And it's very, very, uh, it has a great deal of appeal to ordinary people. Now, last but not least, uh, women um, are encouraged by this time to spend a lot of time in the church and have a lot to do in church organization. So this is very much in contrast to uh, Anne Hutchinson ex uh, experience about a hundred years before. And the unexpected side effect of this was that if women are having a great deal of say in church organization and uh, church events, they were actually going to be bringing their men along. And they, the women are going to be insisting that their men go to church. And again, this has a profound effect on church organization and uh, church involvement. So people uh, really did uh, this, this, this dynamic or really appealed to people. It really appealed to women especially. And uh, it has a tremendous effect on uh, uh, spirituality in America. So this is one of those events that we just cannot get away from. Or we cannot ignore this. Uh, we have to understand that, that spirituality was a very important part of American history through the time when we're talking about. Okay, uh, the next slide uh, continues to talk about this. And again, it's just some of the background um, uh, issues that affect the Protestant movement. Uh, it divides up the Protestant church in some of these splinter organizations, and the issue here is the origins of the Baptist and Methodist movement, which really begin uh, here as a result of the Great Awakening in America. So on that note, let's go on to the next slide and take a look at uh, some of the issues that, that uh, affect Protestantism. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, this is a very complex slide, and I don't want you to get uh, confused or uh, really uh, uh, intimidated by the complexity of this slide. What I really want you guys to get out of this is sort of the origins of Protestantism. We're going to go through very briefly indeed uh, the, the fracturing of the Protestant church. And then, uh, as you can see, kind of in the, in the lower right, uh, the, the, the growth of some of these uh, fractured, fractured elements of the, of the Protestant movement. 
Now, before 1517, before 1517, all Christians in most of Europe were Catholics. Catholicism really means universal. That's what the phrase really means. So the universal church. This is Roman Catholicism. In Eastern Europe, there was the Byzantine church. There was the Coptic church in Egypt, the oldest Christian church even today. Uh, further east still in uh, Russia is the Greek Orthodox. That's the Greek and Ortho Russian Orthodox. But what we're talking about in Europe here is, before 1517, is the Catholic Church. Then in 1517, Martin Luther, you can see his picture there. Please don't get confused by this, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther. Now Martin Luther emerges. He is a lawyer for the church. And Martin Luther sees all sorts of inequity and heresies going on within the Catholic Church. He embarks upon a pilgrimage to Rome, and this is a very, very negative uh, uh, experience for him. Martin Luther was a man who just felt haunted. He, he, uh, he was very uh, he agonized over spirituality and the condition of his soul. At one point he was confessing two or three times a day. He would have these uh, uh, urges, he would have these thoughts, and he would say, listen, I've got to, I've got to get this out, I've got to expunge this. So as um, in many writings about Martin Luther, uh, a good one is a book uh, called uh, Here I Stand. Uh, it's an amazing book about Martin Luther and what he went through. You can just imagine uh, his confessors just rolling their eyes and saying, oh my gosh, here we have Martin Luther again, and he's got to talk about how uh, he had some evil thought. But he saw, Martin Luther saw, the inequities going on in the church, in, in the Catholic Church in Germany in the 1500s. It was a very extractive process. In other words, we had uh, Johann Tetzel uh, selling indulgences, a sort of get out of hell free card. Uh, it would, there's many examples of these that exist. It would say, for the period of the next 10 days or the last 10 days, you're absolved of all sins. Now give me so many marks, give me so many guilders, give me so much money. Well, Martin Luther saw that this was, that's not Christianity. That has nothing to do with Christianity. So he protested in October 1517. Uh, he nailed the 95 Theses to the door in the Church of Wittenberg. And this began the Protestant movement. It rocks along for a few years. You can kind of see the timeline there at the bottom. Rather confusingly, it's read from uh, uh, right to left. So there's Luther, and he begins Protestantism. This exists and, and begins to grow uh, in the 1500s. By the 1530s, 1540s, it's very, very widespread. A rule of thumb, ladies and gentlemen, is that the farther you are away from Rome in Europe, the more likely you are to be Protestant. That is to say, these northern German states, the Dutch, the English, they are all going to be Protestant. By the 1530s, the English are all becoming very, very Protestant. But Protestantism, as it develops in the late 1500s and early 1600s, it becomes fractured. There are different groups within Protestantism that suggest, you know, our group is right, our way of worship is right, and everybody else is rather incorrect, they're wrong. Consider, for instance, again, taking a look at the timeline in the lower right, the Calvinist. On the far left of the, of the slide, you can see Jean Calvin. Uh, he was a uh, Swiss. He felt like there should be a separation of church and state. Uh, he felt like um, Protestantism was turning back to the excesses of Catholicism. In other words, secular leaders, mayors, and governors, and burgomeisters were using their spirituality, their standing in the local church, to exhibit power over other people, doing this in the name of God. And he felt like this was really, really wrong. So John Calvin goes on a, uh, a sort of reemerges, reinforces a purified church. If it's not in the Bible, you can't have it. Sola Scriptura is that idea. If it's not in the Bible, you may not have it. Well, the officials in Switzerland rejected John Calvin, so he had to run for it. Um, and he emerges again in Holland. And he preaches this idea of purifying uh, 
the Protestant movement, getting rid of all the baggage, getting rid of the things that reemerge from Catholicism. The Dutch really did like that a lot. And from that, as we can see again in our timeline at the bottom right, uh, the Presbyterian, the Puritan, the Dutch Reformed Church, and the Wesleyan Methodist movement, they all emerge from Calvinistic teaching, keeping Protestantism pure. If it's not in the Bible, you cannot have it. Now, in the same time, in the late 1600s, the Anglican Church begins to manifest itself. Now, this is uh, very late Elizabethan uh, through the Stuarts, uh, through the um, Interregnum, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, uh, and then uh, in America, especially the Episcopalians and the Methodists. Now, the Anglican Church simply means the Church of England. It is Protestant. The head of the Church of England is the monarch of England, and it suffered from a lot of division. To be clear, in England there were dozens and dozens of divisions, of which really the Puritans are one. Well, moving forward then, we see that in the New World there's dozens and dozens and dozens of groups. Now, how does this apply to the Great Awakening? Well, in the Anglican Church. The various sermons had to be approved of by the archbishops within the Anglican Church. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, the Archbishop of Cornwall. And ultimately, those all had to be approved by the monarch. Well, picture this. Let's put that into practical applications, ladies and gentlemen. If you're sitting in a church on a Sunday and you're priest stands up in the pulpit and reads a sermon written by someone else it is singularly boring you're not your spiritual needs are not being met well the great awakening comes out of that the spiritual needs of the people are not being met so our thesis statement then on the great awakening is that the spiritual needs of the ordinary people are not being met by the anglican church so when we talk about Jonathan Edwards, when we talk about uh, these other uh, uh, Cotton Mather, when we talk about these other uh, leaders of the Great Awakening, understand that they feel their spirituality very, very powerfully. These are very Protestant men. They're very uh, uh, attuned to what the Bible says. And they are reacting to a need exhibited by the ordinary people, a spiritual need. They, people are crying out for a new spirituality, a Great Awakening. So on that note, let's go on to the next slide, and we'll put some, uh, as Dr. Buchanan used to say to me, let's put some meat on those bones. Let's explain this. Let's see how this actually works in the new world. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let me introduce you to a new topic. Now, we've talked before about the role of newspapers uh, in the colonies, and what I want to do here is capitalize on that and talk about a court case. Now, we've not talked about a court case before. Uh, in this course of instruction. And so first let me give you a, a, a sort of mechanism for how we deal with court cases. Invariably, I will give you the background of the case, I'll try and give you the defendant side and then the prosecution side, then I'll talk about the outcome of the case and then what it means to American history. Later on we will be talking about some Supreme Court cases. Marbury versus Madison, there will be a half a dozen others. The Dred Scott case, we will talk about that in 1301. So it's important that you understand how I approach a, Supreme, a court case of this nature. Background, defendant side, prosecution side, the outcome of the case, and then what it means to American history. So let's start then with a little bit of background. Now, John Peter Zinger was a German immigrant. He apprenticed, he arrives in the New Worlds and he apprentices uh, at about age 17 to a New York newspaper. Newspapers, as you well know, are widespread. He learns the English language, he learns how to set the type, he learns how to produce the paper, he learns everything necessary to uh, know about running a newspaper. So once his apprenticeship was done, he established his own New York newspaper, the New York Weekly Journal, and this was in the 1730s, in the mid-1730s. Now, I want to I want to expand upon this for just a few minutes. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, back in the in the time frame we're talking about, uh, throughout the 1600s and 1700s, illustrations in newspapers were extremely expensive. They were made by woodcut, or they were made by generic images. They were copper plate cuts. They were very, very expensive to put into a newspaper. Therefore, most newspapers were all verbiage. We've kind of seen that before. I'll have an example in the next slide coming up. They're all verbiage. So in this particular case, John Peter Zinger has to come up with enough newspaper material, enough stories, to publish once a week a, a, a newspaper to get something out there that the public wants to see. Now this required not just John Peter Zinger, but any publisher to gather overseas newspapers, German newspapers, Dutch, English, Scottish, and pluck articles out of those newspapers, translate them if necessary, and put them into, in this particular case, the New York Weekly Journal or their own different newspaper. Well, today all of that would be covered by copyright laws. And copyright laws were known at the time, but they were just very, very difficult to enforce. Everybody was doing this. To fill up the, ne the need for, uh, the demand for newspaper articles, everybody just recopied other people's stories. Furthermore, and this is good background information, you do need to know this. Back in those days, uh, you could be sued for libel. Everybody could sue everybody else, and that happened a lot. So to protect oneself, the writer often went by a nom de plume, a name of the feather. This is to say an assumed name. So with that background information in mind, let's proceed to this particular case. John Peter Zinger finds an article about the governor of New York, William Cosby, and we'll get to him in a minute. And he found this to be a very interesting article, something that his readers might want to know, so he published it. Now, the governor did not like the paper, was very negative about him, so he sent his agents around and arrested John Peter Zinger for seditious libel. Now, sedition, let's, let's examine this phrase for just a moment. You can see it there on the slide. It's all bold and capitalized letters and, and uh, italicized. Seditious libel. Sedition is information that undermines the authority of government. It's anything that really under, undermines the authority of government. That's what sedition is. And libel is a lie in print. Slander is a lie uh, verbally. But libel is uh, a lie in print. So we put that together, a lie that undermines the authority of government. And that's really what the charge was against John Peter Zinger. So John Peter Zinger was arrested. And no one wanted to take the case in New York. The New York liar, lawyers were very afraid of the governor. They were very afraid of the court system. If they took a case that went against the governor, uh, they may be disbarred. They didn't want to do that. Well, it came to pass that after about three or four months in jail, John Peter Zinger got a lawyer. And the lawyer came from Philadelphia. The lawyer came from Philadelphia. And this Philadelphia lawyer said, uh, Behold, I'm going to win this case, and I'm going to show you how I'm going to do it. Uh, I, am going to, I have a way to win this case, and, and we're going to make this thing work. So uh, we're going to talk about the trial in the next couple of slides, and then we're going to take, the, take a look at uh, the results in the next couple of slides. So let me end here, and let's go to the next slide. So first, let's take a look at what newspapers looked at looked like at the time. Uh, here you can see a copy of the London Gazette. I believe it's from 1674. And then on the right side of the slide, you can see the New York Weekly Journal. This is John Peter Zinger's uh, newspaper. And as it turns out, this particular copy of the newspaper, this particular page, is in fact John Peter Zinger's account of the trial. You can see uh, listed there are the jurors. Uh, he shows his entire, you know, he tells the whole story right there in his newspaper. And so uh, you can kind of see some funny spelling there, Monday, M-U-N-D-A-Y, and uh, there are some other funny spelling that's going on in there. But again, uh, to support this idea that um, illustrations were very difficult to do, you can see that there's nothing but verbiage on these pages.
So with this uh, little bit of evidence in mind, uh, let's kind of go on to the next slide and um, uh, take a look at the, at the trial itself. And the trial is going to begin here in 1735, the trial of John Peter Zinger. And uh, the lawyer, a guy named Andrew Hamilton, comes up from Philadelphia and he begins the case. Now, Mr. Hamilton had no fear of the governor of New York, so he could try the case with uh, a certain degree of, of courage. Of, of, uh, there was no fear of prosecution of himself later on. Furthermore, he approached this case in a very uh, interesting way. Instead of trying to go to the judge and talk to the judge and trying to convince the judge of guilt or innocence, Mr. Hamilton very, very cleverly appealed to the jury under English law, famously 12 men good and true. Now think, think, think of what these jurors are. Think of their socioeconomic group. These are local landowners. They're, they're this tiny, they're an element of this tiny local uh, elite. Uh, these are men who uh, are all about upholding the law. So Hamilton appeals to them and very, uh, in a very clever way of uh, turning of a turn of events, if you will, uh, he said, listen, not only did John Peter Zinger print what he printed, we don't know who it was that, that wrote the article. It was under an assumed name, and John Peter Zinger didn't know who that was. So John Peter Zinger did, in fact, publish those articles. But what did the article say? They said that William Cosby, the governor of New York, was up to no good, that he was mismanaging the people's money, that he was doing things as governor that he ought not to do. And Hamilton then revealed to the jury that not only had John Peter Zinger uh, published this, uh, these things about William Cosby, but William Cosby was doing all sorts of other things that he ought not to be doing as the governor of New York. Uh, he was... Um, having wild parties and he was doing all sorts of things that the people would not ordinarily approve of. In other words, what John Peter Zinger had published was the truth. John Peter Zinger had published the truth. And so, let's really quickly go on to the next slide and uh, see what the results of this thing is. In other words, the defendant says, I published the truth. The prosecution says, what you've done is a lie that undermines the authority of government. So on the prosecution side, it seems that they have an open and shut case. The evidence is going to be these articles published by John Peter Zinger. That was unambiguous. His name was on the newspaper and there were the articles. To the prosecution side, this seems like an open and shut case. On the defendant's side, on John Peter Zinger's side, he says, his lawyer says, he published the truth. That's, in other words, how could the truth be undermining government. It was William Cosby's conduct that was undermining the credibility of government. And if it's the truth, then it cannot be libel. Those are the two sides of the case in a nutshell. So again, let's go on to the next slide and see what happens. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so here we are. Now, as it turns out, I'm particularly proud of this slide. If you look along the uh, left side there, you'll see the actual court document dated August 4th, 1735, page 177. And the first entry up there, highlighted with that bracket, is the John Peter Zinger case. It is the King versus John Peter Zinger. And in the verbiage that you can see there at the top of the slide, on trial, in other words, I translated all that uh, rather uh, strange script, on trial, the evidence offered by Mr. Attorney General was two newspapers, which were owned by the defendant, that is to say, John Peter Zinger. And if you recall, Hamilton took the case to the jury, and the jury brought in their verdict of not guilty. John Peter Zinger was acquitted, all charges. So that's the outcome of the case. Now what does this mean to American history? And that's why I went over this case in such detail. The meaning of this establishes in America freedom of the press, one of our most treasured uh, uh, liberties in America. But more importantly on analysis, what the John Peter Zinger case does is it, it turns journalism from simply entertainment, which it still is in most of the English-speaking world and in most of Europe. 
we find that journalism is a matter of entertainment. Almost all newspapers in England and, uh, and on television are about entertainment more than they are about uh, analysis, facts and analysis. But in America, from a very early time, journalists, that is to say the public press, were depended upon by the public to get the truth out there, to get to the truth. One could still be sued for libel if you got caught in a lie. That does not go away. But Americans recognize in the colonies and then to this very day that it's more seditious for our political leadership to do things that they ought not to be doing. That's what undermines the credibility of government. Finding that out is the role of journalism. And that is a value that we carry right through the 1700s and right through to today. Now certainly today uh, journalism always takes a hit because they get things wrong or they become sensationalistic. But in America Broadly speaking, we insist upon our journalists getting the facts right. So as you can see, this case had a long, long lasting impact on American history. It establishes the idea of a free press and the duty, the duty of the press is to get to the truth, to be accurate in its facts and be accurate in its analysis. So the John Peter Zinger case. Uh, now, William Cosby was the governor of New York at the time, and there's his picture, as you can see it there, and he was placed under a lot of scrutiny, and there was a lot of uh, disagreement about what to do with him next. He was the governor for a few more years. Remember, he's appointed by the king, uh, but then he's uh, replaced um, in, the, in the early 1740s. So let's, uh, let's go on to the next topic. Uh, it's going to be a, uh, uh, a topic that's very sensitive and I want you guys to uh, understand that uh, your book talks about this in a very vague and kind of a cursory way we're going to be examining this uh, uh, issue uh, in depth and it's going to be uh, I don't know how else to put it it's going to be a little bit unorthodox you're probably never going to have heard it portrayed this way uh, uh, ever before so let's take a look at the continuing development I mean the, the large topic here is the continuing development of the colonies and now we're going to take a look at the economy of the colonies, and that uh, leads us to the triangular trade routes and the slave trade. So let's go on to the next slide and see what we can make out of it. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to talk about now, uh, just make a line in your notes, and we're going to talk about slavery in the colonial period. So, uh, as it turns out, for me, on a personal note, this is a very difficult discussion to have. And so I want to start by saying, uh, I understand what the moral issues are with slavery. I do. Slavery is evil. One of the best things we ever did in American history was end slavery in the 1860s and 1870s. But we have to approach slavery as, a, as an event in American history in a more objective way. So let's talk about, uh, stepping down a little bit, let's talk about uh, the economic development of the colonies. The economic development of the colonies. That's the setting of this. We'll talk about the triangular trade routes. We're going to talk about the what, where, why. We'll talk about slavery in Africa. In other words, in this, I want to talk about the origin of the individual slave. Then I have some statistics for you. Uh, there will be a sheet on these statistics. There will be some of those numbers that are important. And I will want you to make sure you take a good strong note of those. We will talk about the Middle Passage. In other words, we have to get slaves out of Africa and into the New World. Last, we will be talking about conditions in the Caribbean. And that will be the place where that will be where the money is being made at. And so I will have to take a really close look at that. Then we will have some conclusions on slavery. Alright, so uh, again, as a reminder, uh, the, uh, the issue of slavery, I understand that. It is very, uh, I, I'm trying to be very sensitive about it. The moral issue is clear. What we need here is objectivity. So let's go on to the next slide and we'll put this into a, um, an objective setting. We're only going to be talking about money. I, I, I hate the idea of taking human beings and reducing them to uh, uh, an economic um, object, but that's what people at the time did. So as we go through this, try and remain objective. All right.
let's plunge into this thing. It's going to be a beast, but let's try and uh, work it all out. Let's try and understand the economic growth of the colonies, which really goes, uh, when we're talking about slavery in the colonial period, uh, we're talking about from 1688 really to the end of slavery, which happens 1802, 1803. All right, let's get on with it then. All right, here we see a, a large map that indicates the triangular trade routes. And what I want you guys to get out of this, first and foremost, and please make a, make a very strong note on this. We talk about the triangular trade routes. There are three destinations. There are three destinations that are directly or indirectly involved with the slave trade. Europe, Africa, and the New World. We speak about the slave trade. All of Europe was involved in this. When we talk about Africa, at the time there were nations in Africa, but not states. But all of Africa was involved in this, and we'll get to that. When we talk about slavery in the New World, all of the New World, North, Central, and South America, was involved. Repeatedly, you'll see in the books, you'll see in popular images, that it's only England, Africa, and the colonies. That is false. I'm all about myth busting in this entire presentation, and that's a big myth to bust. It's very, very difficult to break that myth. Our three destinations are Europe, Africa, and the New World. So let's start there in Europe. How can I say, how can my thesis be that all of Europe was involved in the triangular trade? Well, for this we have to go back to, as we were speaking about before, what are trade goods? Now our list of trade goods, and hopefully you've taken a good note on this, and hopefully you haven't forgotten about it. Trade goods are glass beads. They're musket shot and powder. It's knives and hatchets. It's iron kettles. It's blankets and brightly colored cloth. Okay, well let's take a look at where that was manufactured. Now you have no way of knowing this, but one of the glass manufacturing centers of Europe was really in Czechoslovakia, modern Czechoslovakia, in and around Prague. If you go there today, you're going to find um, crystal uh, being manufactured. The jewel capital of Germany, uh, of, of Europe really, is uh, a little town called Eder Oberstein in the heart of Germany. So glass is really being manufactured in Central Europe, hundreds of miles away from any port. Cloth manufacturing, we're talking in there, modern day Belgium, modern day southern Holland, England as well. But in France, there was a growing uh, uh, textile industry. When we talk about musket, shot, and powder, well, every country in Europe had to have an arsenal. Europe was in incessant warfare at the time. They were always involved in one war after another. We've talked about this, and we will talk about it again, especially in the Seven Years' War. So in times of peace, to keep the arsenals open, the state kept saying, keep manufacturing weapons. We will simply dump all of our musket shot and powder either in, either in the colonies as trade goods or in Africa in the tra as trade goods. So when we talk about musket shot and powder as a trade good, all of Europe was manufacturing that. Everyone was doing that. Steel, uh, especially for hatchets and knives, that was coming from central Germany, Solingen, uh, in the Ruhr Valley in central Germany, that, is, that was the steel producing capital of Europe. Uh, another steel producing uh, capital uh, element of Europe was in Spain. Uh, Spanish steel was thought of as being one of the best. But England was emerging as a steel producing and iron producing country and they made trade goods, pots and pans. So when we speak of trade goods, especially those that are involved in the triangular trade route, these things are going to Africa and they are coming from all over Europe. Now when we speak of slavery in Europe, just as a side note here, uh, there's a tiny fraction of slaves that actually do go to Europe. We've talked about this before. Slavery in Europe was allowed only under extremely specific circumstances. When most of these slaves arrive in Europe, they're going to be immediately freed. But the setting is what I want you to understand about this. In Europe, the rich, wealthy, and elite used servants to do everything. They put their servants in livery, that is to say, the colors of their house, orange and black, or whatever those colors may be. 
Well, as a piece of human ornamentation, rich, wealthy, and elite people would typically import slaves as a topic of conversation. In other words, all the rich, wealthy, and elite had servants, but only the richest and most exotic uh, of the elite, uh, that is to say, only the, the most uh, uh, influential of the elite, would have a black person as a slave. And this was thought of as being exotic. People wanted that as a topic of conversation. Of all the slaves exported from Africa, and we'll get to those numbers in a minute, less than 1% will actually go to Europe. But there are some. The big issue that I want you guys to get out of this slide, number one, three destinations. Europe, Africa, and the New World, North, Central, and South America. The next big thing I want you guys to get out of this is all of Europe was involved. We cannot have an emphasis on simply England being involved in the slave trade. As it turns out, the biggest slave trader was Portugal and Spain by far. So every European nation was involved in this. And as we go through the rest of this, we'll, I'll show you evidence upon evidence upon evidence that supports that. So just keep your eye open for it. Now let's go on to the next map. It's going to show kind of the differences. Uh, we're going to go transition now and start talking about slavery in Africa. Slavery in Africa is our next destination. Okay, so let me close this out and let's go on to the next slide. What we're trying to explore in this particular slide is the origin of the individual slave. We need to discover the origin of the individual slave, not slavery. That's a separate issue. That's, that's the blanket issue that we're trying to, to take a look at in the context of the triangular trade. But now, how did the original, how did the individual become a slave? Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at slavery in Africa. And that's the context of this entire slide, which is going to take us a while to get through, I have to say. Slavery had had a place in African culture since time immemorial. For those of you who are familiar with the Holy Scriptures, you understand that the Israelites, that's what they were doing in Egypt. They were slaves of the Egyptians. Well, that was 3,000 years before the time we're talking about. So slavery had always existed in some form or another in Africa. Now, as an institution, slavery is different than it is in the New World. So let me start with that. We're talking about the origins of the individual slave. Now listen, in Africa, it was only the individual who was a slave, and that is to say, not his family or his offspring. Very often the individual is not born into slavery. He became a slave during his life. So slavery in Africa is not heritable. It cannot be inherited. It's only for the individual, which is completely different than slavery in the New World, and we will get to that in a little while. So how does one become a slave in Africa? Now, I want to be clear on this, and again, we will see this in the next couple of slides. All of the eyewitnesses say so. All of the eyewitnesses agree on this. The individual becomes a slave almost invariably as a result of being a prisoner of war. There's debt slavery as well, but most slaves are going to be prisoners of war. Every one of my sources say this. All of them say this. They all say the same thing. So let's take a look at that. In sub-Saharan Africa, there was constant, never-ending, perpetual, low-level warfare. Now there's a reason for this, ladies and gentlemen, and the reason why is that Cattle, the root of this is that cattle are the, the expression of wealth. They were the money in that culture through, throughout time. The more cattle that an individual or a tribe had, the more wealthy they were. Now, this may come as a shock to some of you, but cattle eat grass. And so, in times of drought, to maintain your herd of cattle, you need to have more land. In times of good rains, well, you could kind of contract just a little bit and, and keep your cattle fed. But the result is the same. There was a constant low-level warfare over control of the land to feed the cattle. Notice I didn't say ownership of the land. Africans don't understand ownership of the land. 
but they do understand control of the land. You needed to have more grass to feed more cattle. So if a drought strikes the region, all of the tribes go to war with each other, basically for the same reason, to control more grass, more of this scarce commodity. The losers of these conflicts then become prisoners of war and are immediately slaves. They are enslaved. So all of the tribes in Africa are well motivated to fight all of the time to preserve their wealth. And unfortunately, the individual becomes a slave as a prisoner of war. Now let's proceed from that point then. What would be the tasks of the ordinary slave in Africa? And what I'm driving at here is that slavery is different in Africa than it is in the New World. To be clear, there is no stigma attached to being a slave. A slave in Africa does not lose the condition of humanity, and that very often happened in the New World, in New World slavery. There's no stigma attached to being a slave. In other words, you become a slave for a tribe, an adversarial tribe, and the tasks are no different than what you would do in your home tribe. You have to tend the cattle, you have to bring in firewood, uh, you have to tend some garden. You're doing things that you would ordinarily do back at home. There are no tasks as a slave in Africa that would be reserved strictly for the slave. He's just taking over the workload that the tribe would ordinarily have to do. Now this will become important in a moment when we talk about the willingness of the African chiefs to, to trade their slaves away. So to reiterate, in Africa there had always been slavery. The slave was only, the slavery was only exposed to the individual for himself and through the course of his life. And he could become free. Many is the example of slaves marrying into the tribe that captured them or being freed for some reason or another. There's no stigma attached to being a slave in Africa. So when white traders come along, for economic reasons that we're going to get to in just a moment, there's no reason for the Africans to not sell slaves to the, to the Europeans, directly or indirectly, so we'll get to that in just a moment. So okay, slavery in Africa, it always been there. No stigma. So let's get on to this actual trade between, in other words, let's try and get the, the, the African slave out of Africa and start his journey, a horrible, spectacularly terrible journey, to the New World. All right? Now, the verbiage on this slide um, really encapsulates what we're, what we're going for. We're talking about now the interface between the African tribes and uh, the Europeans as they start to take these slaves out of Africa and send them to the New World. Now Europeans could not go to the deep interior of Africa and actually execute the trade. That was done by African middlemen. I cannot stress this point clearly enough. All of the observers of the time talk about this. Only rarely do you actually hear about Europeans going to the interior. And this will become clear for reasons that we're going to get to in just a moment. But to make a long story short, Africans within, deep in the heart of Africa, would be very suspicious about white men. The white men would be in a tremendous minority, and the African chiefs would be very, very suspicious. So let's put this into practical application then. An African trader a middleman arrives at the tribal location deep into Africa, well away from the coast. He indicates to the chief that he wants to trade and he has trade goods. Now again, what unifies these trade goods, and I've emphasized this many times before, these are goods that the tribe could not make for themselves. These are goods that the African chiefs could not make, they couldn't produce for themselves. The trader says that I want slaves, and he's going to give these trade goods, musket shot and powder, glass beads, blankets, brass, goods of this nature. The chief then canvasses the slaves that he has, and observe ladies and gentlemen that he's going to get rid of the slaves that are the most useless to him. 
they're physically hurt, they're older, they have no teeth, uh, there may be a social problem there, perhaps the slave is uh, lazy in one way or another, or uh, failed in his duty to protect the cattle from the lions. It could be that the slave, and this happened in the case of Oronoko, uh, was uh, having a relationship with the king's daughter, and the king didn't appreciate that, so he got rid of uh, a slave, in this case, again, Oronoko, we'll get to him in just a moment, uh, and, and traded him away. So at that point, let's, let's exhibit a little bit of analysis. By trading the slaves away, that aided the tribe. They got rid of their dead weight. I hate to, Again, I hate to make this uh, into an economic thing because we're talking about human lives here. But that's the way they saw it at the time. Remember, the chief has no reason not to sell slaves to these traders. He already, has he already has slaves, and slavery has been part of the background since time immemorial. Let's take a look, though, at the role of the African chiefs at this stage. Now, I want to be clear on this. The African chiefs were a river to their people. In other words, when the chief got all these trade goods, he did not keep that wealth to himself. He gave these things to his people. He gave the women these bolts of beautiful cloth that they could not make. He gave mirrors, which seemed to be a very, very uh, important uh, um, material to the spiritual leadership. They were thought to have a magical quality to them. So even a broken mirror fetched a high price in Africa, and that was given to the spiritual leadership. Uh, the beads would be given to the chief's favorites. Uh, the musket shot and powder to the hunters, to the warriors. In, uh, in the Dalme, in the kingdom of Dalme, for example, uh, the king had a royal regiment, and this was called the king's fawn, F-O-N. The king's fawn in Dalme, and uh, Europeans talked about this in tremendous fascination, was entirely women, but they were the most ferocious warriors, and they were invariably equipped with musket shot and powder of the newest variety. So the king, in a battle, would be observing the battle, and when he saw the, the, the moment of truth, he would send in these screaming women who were invariably headhunters and were completely authorized to take take no prisoners at all. He would send these musket armed women uh, screaming at the enemy and break them and uh, capture everyone else. And so the people receive the benefits of the trade from the king. He is a river to his people. And I can't overemphasize that. So let's, let's kind of tie this all together then. The African chief gets rid of slaves that are useless to him and to his people in one way or another. And in return for that, he gets goods that he really, really does need. He can't make for himself. And then he gives those goods to his people. This turns into a political benefit for the king. He is very, very popular. Now, over time, and many is the historian who talks about this, the Africans then become addicted to these goods. When the slave trade ends, it's very tricky for the Europeans to stop the trade in Africa because the Africans are addicted to these goods. Well, that's just the natural course of events. But next, and this is these illustrations, that let me draw your attention to these illustrations that you see here. And especially the illustration on the upper left. This is in almost every textbook. I'm pretty sure it's in your, your textbook, certainly in some of the earlier editions. But what we see here is exactly what I just got finished describing. And this is an illustration from the era. It's black traders taking these slaves down to the coast. In the other picture, you can see, again, black traders, African traders, taking these slaves down to the coast. And um, in a spectacularly horrible event, in that smaller image there, you can see one of the slaves has collapsed from exhaustion and is going to be brutally murdered right there on the trail down to uh, the coast. So their horrible existence is just beginning uh, as, 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 as slaves. But in that interface between uh, the, the origin of the slave as a prisoner of war and then being traded to other African traders, uh, understand that the chiefs have every motive to trade and no reason not to trade. 
on a couple of examples, and I'll get to this in a little while, uh, Orinoco, in particular, was able to get back to Africa, having been traded away. He goes back to his home tribe, and he, he explains in, uh, in graphic terms what it means to be a slave in the New World. But consider this. If the chief did find out what slavery was like in the New World, he couldn't really stop the trade because the trader would simply say, okay, I'll take all of my trade goods and go to the next king. I'll go to the next village. They'll take those goods. You will be uh, uh, hurt thereby. The next village will get the musket shot and powder. They'll get the wealth. And in the next war that comes along, your people, the trader would say, will be the losers in that. And therefore, you will be enslaved. Understand that as time goes on, the trade is perpetuated. It perpetuates the slave trade. All right? So again, uh, kind of a date range here. We're talking about really 1688, the height of the slave trade, 1750s, 1760s. And then by about 1800, and I'll get to that in a little while, the slave trade begins to slow down and then comes to an abrupt end around 1803. But we will get to that when I talk about the conclusions on slave trade. Okay, so that's slavery in Africa. And again, uh, the last thing that it says in your verbiage there, place slavery in the con context of the time, place, perception. I know the moral issues. The moral issues are clear. But this is an economic issue. So let's try and be objective here. All right, let's go on to the next slide and see what happens to these poor individuals next. All right, let's digress for just a moment. We've... Uh, We've examined the origins of the individual slave. Now let's digress for a moment and talk just a little bit about the numbers and the directions. On the map here you can see a comparative flow chart. That is to say the larger the arrow, the greater the number went in that direction. And as you can readily see, almost half of all the slaves are actually going to go to South America. Now I'm trying to bust a myth here, ladies and gentlemen. And the myth is that all slaves went to the colonies. That's false. That's untrue. Most slaves actually went to South America, about 50%. About 40% or so, and the next slide will have more uh, accurate numbers for you in just a moment, went to the Caribbean. Now, uh, really briefly, most of the slaves that go to South America, they're actually exported by the Portuguese. Remember that all Europeans are involved in the slave trade. And I'm sorry to say that they went to South America and promptly died. Uh, the diseases that are endemic in the rainforests in Central and South America are completely different than those in the Congo Basin and the Bight of Benin along the, uh, um, the Ivory Coast of Africa. So these unfortunate people were transported across the Atlantic in the Middle Passage, and again, we'll get to that in just a moment. And then, especially in South America, they promptly died. But you can see that a large percent of them went to the Caribbean, and we will get to that in just a moment. Only about 4.6% went to the North American colonies. So we've gotten the slave out of Central Africa, where he was a prisoner of war. He was traded to another African slave trader, and then he was brought down to the coast. There, they are all ganged up, and they await transport to the New World. We will get to that in just a moment. But again, I just want to talk about the numbers, and I want to talk about the directions. You can also see that some of these slaves are coming out of uh, the Savannah region, just at the very base of Sub-Saharan Africa, and they're going to Egypt, they're going to the, through the Sudan, uh, to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, they're going to the Middle Eastern region, uh, they're going up to the North African coast, okay? But throughout the period we're talking about, 1688 to roughly 1800, almost all the slaves are going, in fact, to the New World, North, Central, and South America. Okay, on that note, let's go on to uh, the next slide. It's just going to be talking about the numbers now, and uh, we will take a look at where they are going, all right? So this slide really uh, examines the issue of numbers just by giving you a straight up and down bar chart. Uh, 
And uh, as you can see, uh, we're talking about almost 50% of the slaves went to South America. Central America, about 43%. North America, well, really the colonies, the only ones we're worried about, and that's about 4.6%. Again, I have it over there in the verbiage in red, underlined, and uh, uh, italicized there. Um, so let's take a look at that. Between 1688 and, 18, and 1800, about 10 million individuals were brought out of Africa and sent to the New World. Now, the slave trade really starts slowly in around 1688. And then it grows to an apex in the mid-1700s, 1750, 1770, and through there. And then, again, it, it begins to trail off right around 1800. So, don't be misled by this. In other words, if you divide out the numbers between 1688 and 1800, 10 million individuals, that runs about 85,000 individuals a year. But that's a little bit misleading. During the 1750s, we could suggest that there may be 120,000 individuals a year were being taken out of Africa. Now let's let's apply our ana our analytical abilities to that. The question becomes then: Could the Europeans actually kidnap all those individuals out of Africa? Because that's a big myth. That's a big distortion about what's going on with the with the triangle of trade and the slave trade. That these European ships were showing up on the African coast. And then they were simply grabbing people, really sitting around on the beach, waiting to be enslaved, presumably. There's no way that European ships could show up on the African coast and kidnap 120,000 individuals. Furthermore, again, on analysis, the tribes on the interior are engaged in constant low-level warfare. Even if they didn't have musket shot and powder, they'd be able to easily defeat a ship's crew, 15, 20, maybe 50 individuals that went inshore to do this kidnapping. So it's just not consistent with logic that kidnapping is the main source for these slaves. No, this had to be an economic exchange. Goods for humans, which is spectacularly horrible. I know what the moral issues are. We just have to put this in the context of the time and the place. So continuing on then, of the total number of slaves shipped to the Western Hemisphere, only about 4.6% went to the colonies. Most went someplace else. In the previous slide I pointed out that when the, oh, about 50% went to Brazil and then uh, terribly promptly died. Agriculture in Brazil just couldn't get started. The Portuguese just couldn't manage it. So as we're going forward, let's try and take a look at the next slide, which is going to be about the Middle Passage, and let's try and take a look at why we need so many slaves. In other words, the next few slides I want you guys to be thinking about, what is it that perpetuates the slave trade? What are the issues that perpetuates the slave trade? Why do we need these vast numbers of individuals? Now the answer is, they are the labor force. They are the labor force. But we have to put this in very strict economic terms and in very strict locations. That is to say, in terms of American history, we're only really going to focus on the slaves that go to the Caribbean. All right? So um, let's go on to the next slave. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's go on to the next slide and uh, continue to examine this topic of uh, the triangular trade and slavery in the, in the colonial era. Now this image uh, that's uh, being presented to you now is particularly brutal. Now it's not up to me as your instructor to sugarcoat history, and I refuse to do that. So let's examine what's going on here. This is drawn from life by the surgeon of the slave ship Aurora in 1784. So we're talking here about centimeters, 160 centimeters by 170 centimeters, and that's roughly um, 6 feet by 6 feet, something like that. So if you can imagine, and you may count for yourself the number of people who are in, uh, seen in this slide, this is a terrifically horrible event. And the event here is called the Middle Passage. So we've gotten, we've identified the origin of the individual slave. 
We've shown why he, how he became to be a slave. We've talked about how they got marched down to the coast. We've shown how it can't be a matter of kidnapping, it has to be a matter of trade. Now immediately these slaves have got to be loaded up onto a ship and then sent off to the new world. And again, the moral issue is clear, but let's put this in economic terms. This is called the economy of mass. It was discovered early on in the slave trade that if you had small, fast ship with small cargo, you were going to lose about 10 to 15 percent of your cargo. Human beings. They would die and you would simply throw the bodies over the side. So to make the journey profitable, no matter how fast it was, to make the journey profitable, you use a large ship. You packed as many individuals as ever you could into the hold of that ship because you knew you were still going to lose 10 to 15, maybe 20 percent of your cargo on the middle passage. So you exhibited the economy of mass. To make the journey profitable, any given ship had to be enormous. Now there were small, fast slave ships. There were many of them. And these are sort of a mom and pop organization, as horrible as that sounds. But most slaves were transported in enormous transport vessels and they were simply jammed in. Now let's go on to the next slide which is just as horrible as this one and continue on with this examination of getting the slave out of Africa and into the new world. Again the idea here is what perpetuates the slave trade. If you're losing 15 or 20 percent of your cargo you always need more to replace that. Let's go on to the next slide then. Now in this slide we're still continuing with this discussion about how we get slaves through the middle passage. Now the middle passage is an event and it is a place. The middle passage is that stretch of the Atlantic between Africa and the New World. The event is really what we're talking about now. The actual uh, the horrible treatment of these slaves as they're getting across the, the Atlantic. Now the theory here is the economy of mass. To support this idea, to give you an idea of what's really going on here, in other words, evidence of this, take a look at the, uh, the left side of the slide, the left image. Now this was drawn from life at the time. At the lower end of the image, uh, at the very bottom, you can see that these are all slaves on one of the full decks. In this case, let's consider this to be the Orlop deck. Then halfway up, the Orlop deck, the lowest deck in the ship, they would build a special bench for even more slaves. And then the next full deck up, in this case it would be the gun deck, there would be a bunch of slaves, as the lower image uh, indicates, just basically laid out on the deck. This huge, vast number of individuals all stretched out onto the deck. And then halfway up the gun deck would be another shelf especially built for more slaves. And then at the very top, and that's kind of what the, uh, the, the image on the right shows, this is the weather deck. And you put even more slaves out there, as many as you can pack on board. Now, some of my sources talk about this, and they're very graphic. Uh, Orinoco, a very interesting book, and you can get it in paperback form just about anywhere. It's written by an eyewitness, her name was Afra Bain. Now, Afra Bain, a very interesting uh, figure. Uh, she's English, she's a novelist, and she's a female. And all those are almost unique in the 1680s and 1690s when she was writing. Uh, she was in British Guiana, that is the northern edge of South America, and she wrote the story of Orinoco, and it was an eyewitness account. A new and accurate account, and those ellipses there, that means that the title goes on, and it's a new and accurate account of the slave trade, uh, was by Willem Bosman. It's not a mistype, that's not a misprint. Willem is his name. Willem Bosman worked for the Dutch East India Company, the VOC. And the Dutch East India Company was huge in the slave trade. His book, rather a pamphlet, was simply an instruction manual on how to exhibit the slave trade, how to engage in it. He wrote this for other captains who were going to get involved in this after his time. And he talks about how uh, the slave 
would be prisoners of war. He talks about directly what the slave, uh, what they could be bought for, how they could be purchased. He talks about using uh, a middleman interfacing with African traders to do the job. He talks about the economy of mass. He talks about exactly how to go about the slave trade. There are dozens and dozens of other resources that I could give you that talk about uh, the slave trade. But these are two very good ones, and they, they exactly uh, uh, describe just what I've described in, in, this, in the presentation thus far. So there's a couple of uh, uh, eyewitness accounts for you if you're interested in researching this further. Uh, we're talking about the economy of mass here. You're just jamming these people in. Now, Willem Bossman indicated that while you're on the middle passage, at the first part of the journey, you must keep them all locked up below, the slaves. Because as long as they can see the land, they'll try and riot and overthrow the ship and try and get back to land. But once you're far out at sea, they'll settle right down because they don't have any idea how to sail or navigate the ship. Even in the more famous, one of the most famous uprisings of a slave trader ship, the Amistad, even then, the crew and the captain were able to save their lives and bargain for their lives by telling the African slaves who had overthrown the ship, who had overthrown the crew and taken control of the ship, that they were the only ones that knew how to navigate. They were the only ones that knew how to sail the actual vessel. So that's how the captain and crew that survived the overthrow, that's how they actually lived. But Willem Bosman says, listen, once you're at sea, you have to rotate your cargo up onto the deck. You've got to let them stretch out a little bit, get cleaned off with seawater, get some food. You have to throw the dead bodies over the side as they die. Bosman talks about how the slaves down in the hold are enemies back in their tribal areas. And the white slave traders, the, the white traders putting them into the ship, had no idea about this. So he said occasionally fights will break out down below. It's not them trying to get loose. And this is so spectacularly horrible, but it's the, the slaves fighting each other. They're carrying their war right down into the hold of this, this in the, in the belly of hell, if you will. It's, it's, it's really an awful situation. Then the slaves, who had never been at sea before, get seasick. It's awful. And so you can just imagine uh, the situation. So Willem Bosman explains this. He explains the practical application of moving these slaves across the Atlantic Ocean through the Middle Passage. Again, an event and a place. The place is that stretch of the Atlantic between Africa and the New World. The event is this terrible experience that the slaves had to go through. On analysis though, we're still talking about why, what perpetuates the slave trade. You're losing so many, 15 or 20 percent, on the journey across. So you have to have replacements. Having said that, you're trying to move these slaves as fast as possible across the Atlantic. You have to get them off out of African waters and into the Caribbean as quickly as ever you can. Now, on analysis, what I want to uh, reemphasize on this is that the slaves have got to be waiting for the ship when the ship arrives from Europe. The ship's crew unloads the trade goods. Those go to the interior in a cycle. The trade goods do. As soon as the trade goods are unloaded, the slaves are loaded on board the ship immediately so that the ship can get underway at once. Again, what I'm trying to emphasize with this, the slave crew, the slave ship crew could not capture their cargo. Now, a side note here. Kidnappings did take place. In a very famous letter from the king of Timbuktu to the king of Portugal, he indicated, the king of Timbuktu indicated that that was taking place. And that from that moment on, Portuguese traders had to talk to the king's, um, in effect, his minister of economics, his minister of trade, to ascertain whether or not the slaves being taken out of Timbuktu were actually slaves or if they were victims of kidnap. To be clear, in this letter, the king of Timbuktu was not saying that the slave trade was bad. He was saying that they had the people that were being traded had to be slaves already, not victims of kidnap. 
So this just goes on and on and on and on and on. Let's go into the next slide, the next slide, which I think you'll find very interesting. This is taken from uh, the logbook of the slave ship uh, of a Swedish slave ship. So let's take a look at it and continue on with this idea about the Middle Passage. Well, this slide we're just continuing on with the evidence that. Uh, all Europeans were involved in this and we're continuing on with this discussion of the Middle Passage. Now again, on analysis, I want you to focus on the idea of why do we, what perpetuates the slave trade. So the image that you're seeing in the slide is taken from the logbook of the Swedish ship Amanda. So first, we don't associate Swedes with slave trade. And yet, here's the Swedish ship that was involved with this in the 1760s, at the very height of the slave trade. Now, in this particular case, the ship did all three legs of the triangular trade and made a profit on each leg of the journey. The Swedish ship loaded up uh, trade goods from all the ports of uh, northern Europe and then set sail. And understand that these goods are typically inexpensive. Then, arriving on the African coast, you can see in the image there, this at the Swedish mission station, this Swedish trader is talking to the Africans and making a deal. In the background, you can see there along the uh, sort of the right side uh, of the image, uh, in the background behind the white slave, tra the, the white trader, uh, are all the slaves ready to be loaded up. The slave ship Amanda loaded up two or three hundred slaves and then set sail for the New World. Now observe that initially their course leads away. This is all about the trade winds. This is the age of sail and the ship could only sail as the winds carried her. The prevailing wind in that part of Africa is called the Bight of Benin, B-I-G-H-T of Benin, B-E-N-I-N. Benin is a nation in that region to this very day. But the prevailing wind is from west to east. So in this particular case, and in the case of most of these slave ships, they have to sail down the African coast, south and east. That is to say, away from their ultimate destination in the Caribbean. When they finally catch an offshore breeze, as you can see there, listed as the Southeast Equatorial Current, they can start heading towards their destination. Well, as you can apprehend, by this time they have every stitch of sail up that they can get because they want to increase the, the, the speed of the journey. But they run into a, a weather phenomenon listed there on the map called the doldrums. Well, the doldrums, as you can imagine, it means a place where there is no wind, where there's no activity. So very often they had to drift. And the slave ship, many is the slave ship that lowered down the ship's boats, sort of like a lifeboat, tied on to the ship with lines and cables, and began to row, to row the ship out of the doldrums. Hopefully, catching a, a trade wind, they were able to make time then to uh, the Caribbean. So when we talk about the amount of time it takes to get from Africa to the New World, sometimes as little as two or three weeks, sometimes months were spent at sea. The longer time you spend at sea, the less food they would have for this vast number of individuals stuffed down in the holes. So you can apprehend if the journey takes more than six weeks to two months, it is a losing proposition for the slave ship. They've lost most of their slaves. The survivors, when they finally do arrive in the Caribbean on a journey of that nature, are in very, very terrible conditions. So the slave ship is well motivated to load up their slaves as fast as ever they can and then move as quickly as ever they can to get to the Caribbean. In this particular case, though, the Swedish ship Amanda then unloaded her slaves, picked up presumably trade goods necessary for uh, Europe and then sail back to Sweden. Now we will get to those trade goods in just a moment because that will be the driving force of this entire triangular trade. It's what's happening in the new world that is important. But again, what I want you, to, what you, I want you to get out of this slide. Number one, all the Europeans are involved. 
in this particular case, the Swedish ship Amanda. Number two, speed was critical to success. The middle passage is that stretch of the Atlantic between Africa and the New World. You had to get across it quickly or you would lose too many slaves. That's the event. Finally, when you get to the New World, you're going to offload your slaves as quickly as you can. And one last note I want you guys to make about uh, this particular slide. Not all ships did the triangular trade in this way. There were many ships that only went back and forth from Europe to Africa. There were many ships that only went from the New World to Europe. There were, only, there were many, many ships that only went from Africa and to the New World and back and forth. Many ships just did that part of the leg, leg of the journey. But this, in this particular case, she did all three legs of the triangular trade and she was profitable on all three parts of the journey. By the time this was, thing was over with, the captain, the crew, uh, the owners of the, of the Swedish ship, uh, Amanda in this case, were probably, they made a huge profit. It was, they made them all into very wealthy men. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, we're going to continue on with this, uh, this, this terrible journey and start trying to figure out what exactly is driving the slave trade. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, in this slide, what I really want you guys to get out of this is we're going to focus in on this slide on the slaves that are actually in the colonies. Now, in one of your previous slides, I pointed out the statistics here. Of all the slaves that were sent from Africa to the New World, only 4.6% of those slaves came to the colonies. That's to say, about out of between 1688 and about 1710, when slave trade has ended, only 4.6% of those 11 million slaves are going to come to the colonies. Now, we need to focus in on what those slaves are actually doing in the, in the colonies. We know that the agricultural product that's coming out of the Caribbean is sugar. And a significant proportion of that sugar is going to be for you know, uh, cakes and sugar for eating. Sain Shema, a very uh, famous author that talks about this, uh, suggests that the Europeans, particularly the Dutch and the English, are eating the teeth right out of their heads. That's what he that's what he suggests that they're doing with all the sugar. And sure enough, uh, Europeans, they have a sweet size of a barn door. I certainly do. But we need to focus in on what the slaves are actually doing with the other product that's coming out of sugar production, and that is molasses. Molasses is being barreled up in the Caribbean and then sent to the colonies to be finished off into rum. Now the reason for that is there's simply not enough water in the Caribbean to make rum. They do make some rum down there, but most of the rum production is actually done in the colonies, where they have a virtually unlimited supply of fresh water. So molasses is arriving from the Caribbean into the colonies. This is a very short distance. Within two or three days, you can be uh, out of the Caribbean and into Virginia, into the Carolinas with molasses. Then you offload that, and what you're loading up again is truck vegetables to go back to feed the slaves in the Caribbean. This is what the colonial element of the triangle trade is really, really genuine all about. They are actually the ones that are producing rum, and what they're actually sending back to the Caribbean, food for the slaves. Now please make a strong list about what truck vegetables are. Truck vegetables are squash. It's beans, it's rice, it's hogs, that is to say salted hogs. It was discovered uh, uh, hogs actually, can you can butcher the hog, cut it up into big giant chunks, salt it very strongly, uh, fill the cask full of vinegar, and, and that, that will keep. So just think about that for a moment. Uh, dried beans, dried peas, uh, dried vegetables of that nature, squash, and rice. What unifies all these things is that they travel very well. Now today we find an echo of that actually in Creole cooking. And sure enough you just add just a little bit of fresh food, for instance fresh fish. And what, what else makes up Creole cooking? It's a lot of hard spices that are coming out of the Caribbean, hot spices. It's pork, rice, 
beans. That's exactly what we would think of. That's exactly what we think of when we think of, um, well, African American food. So the slaves in the colonies, the time frame we're talking about, they are growing hogs, they're growing beans, they're growing rice, they're growing these vegetables. Then they're taking these vegetables down to the harbors, they're loading all stuff up in cask for the slaves in the Caribbean. They're offloading molasses, taking that back to these plantations and turning that into rum. That's what the slaves are actually doing in the colonies. Now the verbiage on your... Um, Slave tries to draw attention to the fact that the slave population really concentrated right on the coast and near these major coastal cities. That is to say Norfolk, uh, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, and that's where the slaves are actually concentrated at. The colonies in the time frame we're talking about all the way up into the 1790s have not pushed inland. And that's exactly it's a good reason for that. All of their trade is concentrated on trading with the Caribbean. That's what they're trying to do. All right, so on that note, uh, let's move on to the next issue, and let's try and get the uh, uh, set up uh, the rest of the Seven Years' War.